Hello everybody, this is Chris from CSS Tricks with video screencast number 57. The topic this week is going to be CSS3, something we've not specifically covered, although I'm sure we've used little parts of it before on other screencasts. It's just kind of a hot topic right now. It's always kind of a hot topic because it's this, uh, you know, I guess kind of the current version of CSS, if you call it that, the current recommendation by the W3C is CSS 2.1. Which, uh, you know, and even that isn't fully supported by every browser, and we all know there's lots of, of, of quirks in CSS, period. Um, CSS3 is just kind of a generic name kind of working title that's going to include a bunch of extra stuff that isn't in the CSS 2.1 spec. Uh, that allows us to do, I don't know, there's just new features, basically, most of it. Um... We're going to touch on a lot of those new features, specifically ones, though, that kind of can be used now, because otherwise we wouldn't have much to do a screencast about, and specifically ones that uh, are kind of in the, in the realm of progressive enhancement. That is, uh, little things that you can do now that might enhance the look for some browsers that are supporting them now but aren't the end of the world if uh, uh if you use them they'll revert back to something else that's usable for a browser that doesn't support it most of it will be that way and we'll talk about certain css3 things that do it better than others and stuff like that but uh <clears throat> that's kind of what we'll focus on there's a poll in the sidebar this poll has been up for a few weeks on css-tricks.com it says if CSS2 and CSS3 was fully supported in all browsers tomorrow, what would you be most excited about? And this is the choices below are by no means a comprehensive list of every single thing in CSS3. And I put CSS2 in there because right away, I, one of the things that the popular techniques that gets talked about and thrown into this group a lot of times is this at font face thing, which really isn't even CSS3. It's. <laughs> You know, I was thinking it was CSS2, and then I'm starting to think it even goes back further than that. Anyway, so I didn't want to just say CSS3, because uh, I'm talking about this group of things. Uh, like at, at FontFace, gets kind of chucked in there because this kind of new generation of browsers that's coming out recently, like Safari 4 and Firefox 3.1 beta, and I think Opera like 9.5 up has a lot of this stuff. These are things that they've implemented and are just starting to be able to be really used on a big level uh, uh, pretty recently. That's these things. Border radius, multiple backgrounds, border image, at font face, box shadow, text shadow, RGBA, gradients, and animations and transitions. So it's, like I said, it's not a full list of all the stuff in CSS3. It's stuff that you can play with now and use reasonably in your web designs now. That's going to be the point of this screencast. There's other stuff that's going to be in CSS3. Uh, different kind of uh, things going on with the box model, different display types. There's different layout models, maybe things that can do multiple columns and stuff like that. Those things are harder to deal with now. We could demo them and look them in some browsers that support it, but for something that's important as the layout of your entire page, it's just we're just not at the point yet that you can go ahead and lay out a page using the new column model because it's going to be totally broke, totally busted in, in, in older browsers. And it's just it doesn't fall into that progressive enhancement realm just yet, unfortunately. So we're going to be looking at basically this list right here. And so if you have a favorite, you can come vote and check it out. Uh, we could look at the results. Why not have the things that, that people... Because I'm asking people to pick one thing here, you know, the most popular thing. It looks like, oh, wow. Border radius is winning. It wasn't always. Multiple backgrounds is winning for a while, but I didn't realize at font face is, is, is coming up in like a really close uh, uh, third place here. So, and yeah, it looks so. It looks like border radius is winning. That's probably the most common thing. That's what we'll start with looking at. Uh, it's it's you know it's easily the most common and most used thing here. So let I have a kind of a, a development page set up here on a server where we can we're going to look at like each one of these things and how you do it with CSS. That's what this page is. It's just an ugly random looking page, but we're going to uh, unleash some CSS three onto this page. Uh, let's look at the uh, the code for this in HTML. I'm going to open up Coda. This is our 
FTP text editor that we're just going to be using here for this. This is the index.html file that's powering that page. There's an H1 tag up here. There's a paragraph tag that's got an ID to it. Basically just some markup here that we can... So we have good targets with our CSS to start applying some of the CSS3 stuff. There's an H3 tag, and then there's a bunch of, of, of divs with paragraphs inside of them. Uh, here's one we have called Tack Box, Shadow Box, Border Box. They all kind of have little hints in their names here. They're just divs. They're just generic pieces of HTML that we can target with, H with, with, with CSS to show off some techniques. So <clears throat> that's all we got going on here. And just some Google intellects at the bottom. You can ignore that. Let's take a look at that page again. Here's this H1 tag. Here's that paragraph tag. Here's that H3. And then just a series of boxes. Uh, don't worry too much about them. We're going to tackle them all one by one. We'll start, like I said, with border radius right up at the top. Uh, oh, let me open my style.css file. Controls the look of this page. Uh, not much to see here. This is the bit of CSS that is controlling that top bar, that, that H1 tag up there. It has a background. This is a blue color. doesn't hurt to comment your CSS to remind yourself of what's going on. It has some padding around there. The, the, font, uh, the, the color of the actual text is white, and it has some bottom margin to push stuff away from behind it. Uh, Let's use this as an example for border radius. The official recommended kind of spec for border radius is just going to be border radius. Uh, let's say 10 pixels. If I go ahead and save that and jump over to Safari and reload it, uh, you'll see that even in Safari 4, probably the, the best, the number one, the leading browser for supporting all the CSS3 stuff is Safari 4. They could have easily made this happen, supported border radius, but it's not, a, as I understand it, it's not an official recommendation yet, and they're not going to uh, uh, support border radius until that spec becomes live. But what they do, instead of, of, of supporting something like just border radius, they come out with these what's called these browser extensions, right? I believe is the proper terminology. And they're to, to allow you to... to use exactly what border radius would do only it's not called border radius in the case of safari which is webkit which is the browser rendering engine that powers safari they come out with these you know vendor extensions or browser extensions that do what border radius would do only they have a little bit of a different name so you can play with it now and then they'll start supporting it uh, uh, when it's ready in the case of like i said it's it's, it's webkit so webkit they start with dashes dash webkit dash border dash radius is 10 pixels now if we save it and we jump back over to safari and reload the page indeed all four corners of this will have rounded corners beautiful you can we won't cover every single thing because we have a lot to cover here but you can give only individual corners uh uh rounded corners if you wish to that's no problem there's you know just do a search on css tricks i have it all on there somewhere of of targeting different <clears throat> corners uh but let's not forget about mozilla based browsers which is like you know primarily firefox but there's others like oh i don't know i can't remember the names of them all conquer i think maybe that's webkit what am i trying to think of flock i think is 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 Mozilla based. They have a different browser extension, Moz, for Mozilla, border, radius. So I just wanted to kind of introduce that. A lot of these CSS3 things come in the form of this. Right now, if I was designing this web, web page to, to, to go live and be in production, we may not even include this at all, this border radius. Nothing supports that yet, as far as I know. Only these are supported, these browser extensions. But I figure you might as well throw this anywhere. Eventually it will be supported, and then you can pull out the things that, that, that aren't needed anymore, perhaps down the line somewhere. It's, the, it's kind of the, the right, what's, what's almost surely going to be the final spec for this. So might as well throw it in there. Who cares, right? It will not validate. Neither will these aren't going to validate either. Who cares? 
doesn't matter. Validation is just a tool. It's just to remind you. It's to help you troubleshoot. There are no consequences whatsoever for your CSS not validating. Really, nobody cares. <laughs> and it doesn't hurt anything on your page. Not only do they not care, they shouldn't care because it doesn't it, it, it's not going to affect anything on your page if, 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 if this border radius doesn't exist. Not a valid CSS property. Who cares? <laughs> it's not hurting anybody. <clears throat> okay. That is border radius. The next one we're going to tackle is this at, at font face thing. And like I said, it's not CSS3, so don't harp on me for talking about CSS3 and things that aren't really CSS3. The reason people are talking about it a lot now, including me, is that this new generation of browsers, the Safari 4 and Firefox and all of these, are starting to just now support this at font face thing. So it's becoming a little bit of a bigger deal right now. That's why we're throwing it into the mix now. So how you use at font faces, they call it at, like literally the at symbol. Okay, so we're going to declare something like this, at font face. That's what it, this is what an at font face rule looks like. Uh, I have it down here too. Let me get rid of that. And how it works is you declare a font family. So you'll recognize this. This isn't new at all. Font family, colon, <clears throat> and then uh, give it a name. We're going to be using, for our example here, a font called Fontin. Fontin. Gosh, I didn't think of how to pronounce it first. Let's go with Fontin, and we're going to be using the italic version of it. It's a really nice font, and it's free, and by, uh, God, I wish I had more information about it, but the, the deal, the reason that why you're using it is because they specifically say that they allow this font to be used in this way. Not all fonts are. Please look at the EULA for the font before you use it in this way because it can be illegal to embed a font in this way. This one isn't. Font in italic. Okay. <clears throat> In the same breath here, we give it a source, which points to the file that lives on, hopefully, your server. Uh, I uh, we're on the CSS Tricks server. Actually, the CSS Tricks page uses this font in the footer a little bit, just for fun, because I do think it's a nice font. <clears throat> slash font slash font in italic OTF, which is an open type font uh, oh, before we end this we do need to tell it that format is open type that will make sure that this is now available to us in the future in our CSS for declaring font family elsewhere not in an, another font face rule but literally just like uh, in a CSS selector. So let's see if I didn't screw this up. We're gonna do that. We're gonna target it to that uh, to the paragraph tag here at the top that had an ID of special font. Uh, what the heck, right? <laughs> so um, special font has a font family of well, well you know, let's just use the generic. It works for, uh, not the generic, but the uh, uh, shorthand. Uh, 20 pixels of font in italic. Uh, and we can give it a, a fallback, but you know what? We don't really need it to, because if, if it works, it works, right? It's it, we're, we're, we're kind of quite sure that it will be embedded. So, uh, But, you know, that's, that's dumb and short-sighted of me, isn't it? Because not all browsers support this, so we should really declare a proper fallback. So let's do that. Georgia. Georgia. Serif fonts. Yeah, that's a good idea. Safari. We'll reload it. Hopefully this will take... This is what we have. This element here has an ID of special font, and special font has all that stuff going on in CSS that we just wrote. So hopefully, when I reload this, yay, it will be replaced by Fontin. Fontin uh, isn't even necessarily installed on this local computer. It doesn't have to be. The, it is literally embedding at anybody, even if they had this, never even heard of this font. It's definitely not on their computer. If they're using a browser that supports it, like Safari 4 or these new browsers, it will show up and look just like this. 
this is not a uh, a standard web font you know this is a, a, a you know totally custom and embedded font so that's a pretty cool feature there are so many ways to replace fonts on the web you are, you know we've talked about cipher we've talked about fleer we've talked there there's 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 a couple other that don't have full screencast but that I've talked about before there's this new kufon i'm sure i'm pronouncing that wrong it's like this incredible craving that people have to use custom fonts on the web this is uh, uh, one of the ways, and it doesn't require anything extra fancy. We're not processing anything with PHP in the background. We're not using Flash. It's just it's probably the lightest way, lightest weight way to get it done. So I'm a big I, I like at FontFace, despite the possible legal Im implementations and all that. I think it's pretty nice. Uh, speaking of font stuff, let's move right on to the next thing, uh, and we're gonna look at text shadow. So this is a kind of interesting one. You know, uh, in Photoshop, it's so easy to grab some text and double-click on the layer and bring open the layer styles and get, uh, 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 give something a drop shadow. Even maybe if I pull this down, uh, look at my background. Uh, get out of my way. See the CSS tricks behind here as a drop shadow on? Such an easy thing to do in Photoshop, you know? But uh, <clears throat> if you wanted your text to have... A drop shadow in CSS it would certainly have to be an image right how could you possibly pull off text shadow without it being an image well you can in CSS 3 uh, clearly created just to make the web a little bit of a better place it's easier it's more adaptable you don't have to build images for it it's lighter weight it's something that designers want to have to do but you know you know anyway there's a lot of you know it's just a good idea to, to have this built into to CSS I think and let's take a look at how you actually do it. Uh, it's literally called text shadow, text dash shadow. We're going to be applying it to the H R H three tag. Uh, so this is what it looks like. It looks like text dash shadow. It has three numbers uh, that you give it to it. Uh, uh, most probably, most commonly, probably your best bet to give it to them in pixels. I forgot to research that a little bit. If it takes other things. It may only like pixels. I'm not sure. It goes like this, though. The, the amount of top offset. So imagine there was another bit of text right directly behind it. There's literally two things. If I gave this, this first number one pixel, that bottom one will slide down one pixel. This next number, I give it one more pixel, it will slide to the right one pixel. So one pixel, one pixel in this case here is down and to the right one pixel. The next number is how big do you want this shadow to be? How far do you want the blur to kind of extend here? Let's just play and call it five pixels for now. And then the, the last thing is color. We'll give it a nice dark gray color. And we'll save it and we'll reload the page and see if it has a nice drop shadow to it. It's going to look, oh, you can see it. I don't know how well that showed up for you. It actually doesn't look so bad. Normally black text with a black, you know, a dark gray uh, a drop shadow probably won't look that great. Especially, you know, if we went full on black, it would just look a little bizarre. It would actually kind of hurt the readability of a little bit. You definitely have to be careful with text shadow and maintaining the readability. It's it's a nice bonus. It's a nice feature, but don't don't ruin readability by adding a crazy nasty drop shadow to the bottom of it. Okay, uh, you could even do something like make the color of the text white. Let's make this black, so you can see it'll kind of maybe have a, a kind of ghosty effect. Where you can uh, uh, just see the shadow, you know, the, the, the letters are kind of just knockouts of the thing. Uh, we don't have to give it any, necessarily any distance here. If you just gave it zero, the shadow would be exactly centered behind it. Uh, and you can go as big as this. Let's go 15 pixels and just look. And, you know, it's getting even kind of ghostier there. This is one you want to watch out for, though. See, we've chosen white for the text here and in a, in a dark drop shadow. So you can read it now. I mean, I can read it. It says some boxes below. Very easy to read. For browsers that don't support this now, it will just be white on white text because they don't support text shadow they won't see it if we were to open this even in firefox 3.05 or whatever is the current thing which isn't supporting it yet 3.1 is 3.05 is not you wouldn't be able to see this at all It'd be white on white text bad idea for now i'd avoid uh you know requiring the shadow for it to be able to read and just rather have it be a nice bonus 
So that's how that goes. Text it, it has some some additional powers here. Uh, when I was kind of looking this up, it said they had an example on the CSS3 info site, which is a nice site of text shadow, and that you can apply multiple shadows to one thing. It's not just pick these three things and that's what you get for a shadow. You can actually apply multiple shadows very easily to the same <clears throat> element. Let's take a look. I'm going to paste in their example code that they provided on their site. Uh, there we go. Here's, you know, and they're separated by commas. So it's, you know, top offset, right offset, size, color. Top offset, right offset, size, color. There's a bunch of them here. We got one, two, three, four, five of them. I've made the text back black again. Let's see what their example code looks like with multiple shadows. Wow, fire! Looks cheesy and awful and terrible, but that's it's just it's a good visual example though, and I'm sure that uh, uh, we could apply some artistic merit to this and actually come up with some pretty awesome uses for it. But literally, it looks like <laughs> cheesy burning letters with no images whatsoever, purely with different shadows. So actually, that's pretty cool, I think. Uh, okay, let's jump right on to the next thing. Let's look in the source code to see what I did when I was preparing for this. Tack box. Okay, I'm calling it a tack box, just literally like tack, like thumbtack, to demonstrate the CSS3 feature of multiple backgrounds. This is a big one. Remember, it's it was in first. I think it's in second place in the poll right now. This is what I would have voted for. This is my absolute favorite thing. I think it's going to do the most for web design as far as keeping your code clean and and clean in the fact of 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 it helps semantics. What's a good example here? We're calling this the tack box because what I want to do is put like one little thumbtack looking image in all four corners of this box that we're going to be looking at just as a visual element just because it's kind of neat just because we can if we wanted to do this today and make sure that it works in every single browser probably the best way to do it if we were just dealing with html and css is to put four extra divs in there set position equals relative on the the parent then absolutely position each one of those little divs in the top left corner, the top right corner, the bottom left corner, the bottom right corner, and apply a background image to them. And that's how we would get our text where we want them to get. It works. It's important in all browsers way, way back. And, and that's great. It's no longer semantic. Now we have a bunch of empty divs in our HTML for no It has nothing to do with the content whatsoever. It's just purely a design decision by us. That happens all the time. I mean, it's not just for tack boxes. It's for if you're familiar with the sliding doors technique. That's like if you have tabs on a website. This is used very commonly to have the left little portion of the tab and then a really long right portion of the tab. And as the text grows, it grows and it can stretch apart and st and make a nice looking tab that can vary in width. But in order to do that, you have to you can only apply one background per page element, right? So there's a an extra element included in each piece of the tab so that each one of those can have a background element and they can slide apart. That would be totally obsoleted by multiple backgrounds because you can just take one element, give it a background image to the left, give it a background image to the right, and as it grows, it'll do its thing. It's going to do wonders for us when this is all said and done. Let's demonstrate how that works with our tack box. I have an image, just real quick, I'll open it up. It's called tack.png. It just looks like this. It's a little tiny whatever. It doesn't even look like a tack. I just threw it together as a little dot that we can use in our CSS to demonstrate background, multiple backgrounds. This is how it looks. It looks like background. And you can just, I'm trying to press return here. URL. This part doesn't look any different at all. Images, tack.png, and still no different at all. Top, left, no repeat. But instead of a semicolon to end our statement there, it now accepts commas. Pretty simple. Just give it another one. 
I'll just copy and paste because we're going to use the same image, but you wouldn't have to use the same image. Instead of being in the top left, we're going to put it in the top right. Let's just see how that looks. Done. So in this tack box, which is going to be this box right below, we're moving on to the next one as I reload. It doesn't work. That's classic. Let's come. I'm going to copy and paste the working code. It has all four of them. I'm curious if... It definitely doesn't require to have all four. We'll see if that actually fixes it or not. Oh, was I in the wrong browser? All right, that worked. You can see all the tacks in all four corners, right? That's exactly what we want to happen. That's very cool and very awesome. And uh, hopefully, uh, this maybe wasn't the best example, but uh, uh, the point is in, in here, our div of ID of tack box has no additional markup whatsoever to accomplish this task that's otherwise a huge pain in the ass. It all happens in the CSS like it should. It's just something was weird there of how... Let me delete one of them. You should be able to give it any, really, any number of these. Uh, so the the bottom left one should be gone, right? Yeah, you you know, you, you I gave it four there. You could give it two. You could give it three. There was just something funny. I don't even remember what it does. Doesn't even matter. Uh, I'll put it back for now, though. Notice though that I have to then declare background color separately. Uh, because of this kind of special format, I'm not able to, it looks like shorthand, kind of, but I can't go, come up here and put the background color up here. It won't work. So if you need a color, too, like we did, declare it separately. Not a big deal. <clears throat> Next thing, like we looked at text shadow, we're going to look at box shadow. Box shadow is uh, even easier to use. I'm sure you can imagine what it is if you have a box like a div, like divs are display block, they're just rectangles on the screen. It's a way that you can give those a shadow as well. Probably even more common than text shadow and even more progressive and handsy because you just, you know, you have a little box, you give it a little shadow, it's a nice little flare, you don't have it, not a big deal. Uh, it's That's why this is one of these things that's just really easy to start using right now. So, box shadow. It is called, now this one is really, really similar to rounded corners because it has a spec name. It's called box-shadow. That's how it works. It works a lot like text shadow. Top offset, right offset, size, and color. But if we save it, and now we're dealing with this box now, the next box, demonstrate this new technique. If I reload it, it doesn't work, right? It's one of these ones that only is supported through browser extensions right now. So we'll head back to Coda. I will copy and paste this and give it the proper <coughs> WebKit. WebKit. It will not work. Drop Shadow. Nice. No images. Saves this markup. Makes the thing lighter weight, easier to, to change on the fly. So great. <clears throat> Mozilla as well. Let's not forget. Moz. Done. That's it. Uh, uh, not much to, to realize there. Although, as I support commenting things, especially as you're developing them, it's nice to have a little reminder, isn't it? Let's just paste in a comment there. Top offset, right offset, size, color. So we don't look at this bit of shorthand and be like, um, there's three things there. What are those meaning again? Is the first one the size? No, a little comment just to remind us. Pretty nice. Okay, this next one is weird, and I should have probably researched it in a little more depth. I mean, I can talk about it, and we are going to talk about it. It is border image. In CSS, we have these divs that we're targeting with ID names. You can have a paragraph element. There's header tags. There's 
any element you can possibly think of, you can target with CSS and give it a background image. Anything can have a background image. It's part of what makes CSS so powerful, I think, is that you can use all these sem the, the semantically correct stuff over an HTML and then know that you have the power to do really anything design-wise on the CSS side, in a large part because you can position it where you want, you can make it what size you want, and you can give it a background image to match any design. There is one shocking flaw to this to me in that you cannot give backgrounds to borders and borders are a big part of the box model that that it's just it's just it's, it's, it's a lack it's something that css can't do is is apply border to the, or a background to the border of a thing especially in this in this like fancy and interesting and adaptable way that css3 is going to be able to do that there are probably better tutorials for this to see, but it's 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 pretty cool. What we're gonna do, just to repeat some of the stuff that we already have going on, <clears throat> is just to use that little tack image, and we're gonna do something kind of neat with it. I think this is in the same category as box shadow and text shadow, and that the, the kind of you know 99% share of the final spec for this thing is going to be border dash image. We are giving it our tack image and then a bunch of parameters that are very specific and a little weird and a little strange but I'm sure you guys can figure them out but that won't do anything because it's browser extension thing again so let me just copy and paste the browser extension versions of them in as well that will work they're all the same it's just one of these things with browser extensions we're giving it the same tack image, but notice the, the parameters that we're giving it, say, to stretch. There's a couple different attribute, uh, you know, things we can give this that aren't stretch. There's stretch and round, and I believe that's it. You kind of got to take a little minute to wrap your mind around this a little bit, but let's take a look at the result. 16 is the size of the image, and it's top right, bottom left, I'm pretty sure. And what we want to say is we have a 16-pixel border up top. And we want to stretch that image across the top and bottom. Save it. We'll go take a look. And we're not going to dwell on it too long. Because I think this one is really cool. And there's a lot of possibilities here that requires a bigger tutorial. But we're already, of course, dragging on too long. See what had happened there. Took this little tack image. And it stretched it way across the top of the thing. And it looks kind of awesome, I think. Anyway... Now you can apply backgrounds to borders, and there's a lot of different ways to do this. You can, you know, give it like a cool grungy border, and I don't know, there's so many possibilities here, but I'd rather not dwell on it because it's one of those things that I haven't have a 110% understanding of yet. Okay, RGBA is the next topic. You can see this box already. I, I grabbed a texture. I just like screenshotted some texture from the background of my own CSS Tricks site and applied it here. It's just a repeating texture behind it. It's just that sandy, papery look that I've used forever and ever on CSS Tricks that I really like. And then there's some white text inside it. Now, let's say what we wanted to do is have a stripe of black color across this thing, but it was... It was transparent. You could see through the black a little bit and see the texture beneath it, but it was black enough that this white text would easily show up on it. One of the ways we might have at least attempted to try to do this in the past, and there's multiple techniques, and we've covered this kind of thing before, uh, but one of the ways that we, we might have done that, uh, we have a, a div inside it, is to do something like background black if i just do that we'll reload it and we'll see that we get a bar of black and now we want to knock down that black a little bit and, and so we can see the texture through it we might have gone opacity 0. oh let's say five and we'll reload the page this will work and we'll be able to see the texture through it and knock down the black and you can read the text but look at that text doesn't it? It doesn't look quite right, does it? It doesn't look white anymore. It's because this text is a child element of this div, which has opacity. All children of that div also become just as <clears throat> opacitized, as transparency eed as the parent. We don't want that. <laughs> 
especially in this case because it makes the text less readable. There is no way around it. I cannot target this text with CSS and say, I want that's opacity to be back up to 1.0, 100%. It won't take. It just won't. It's just one of the ways I don't know if it's, 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 it's not a fault of CSS because it kind of makes sense. You know, you, when you change the opacity of, of a parent, you kind of want, you know, let the, you know, think of jQuery or something that slowly fades out something. You don't want to have to target every single child element and toggle the opacity of every single child element. It just makes sense that everything underneath it gets faded too. Anyway, it's kind of a bummer in this case when we specifically want this text to have a higher opacity. That's where RGBA comes in. I think that's its strongest point here. We don't have to do that anymore. We can, instead of declaring just a background of black, we can include the transparency right in with where we give it the background color. So we'll give it, uh, instead of just declaring a color value here, we give it RGB, and R, just RGB if you want to use uh, color values here, 0, 0, 0, that's the same as black. I'll go and reload here and it will be black. You can, RGB is supported, it's been supported for a long time. What's different here is RGBA, which you can give it a fourth value, and that will give it that 0 0.5, and then we can go back in here, we'll reload the page, and it will be <clears throat> the same opacity level the same transparency level but the text is now fully white opaque yay that's the power of rgba i did a whole thing about browser support on this just search for it on css tricks uh, uh it's not so bad really i think you can kind of start using it the trick is if you're going to start using rgba to declare it one before uh, with just with, with, without the color value, if your design can support this, this is the way. This is the way to to give it a proper fallback. So if you don't, if it's just kind of a bonus that it has a little transparency to it, uh, but it works fine as an opaque color. That's the ticket right there. So that's that's the deal with RGBA, kind of a CSS three thing. Uh, gradients is another one of those things. A lot of these things that you'll notice here are saving us. <clears throat> from having to use images drop shadows all of that we would have to use images for that multiple backgrounds well of course that's image related anyway but uh, drop shadows is a big one that saves us from having to use images when we otherwise would have have to gradients is the same thing they're they're in as part of css3 potentially here we're going to give us the ability to create a gradient behind page elements with no images whatsoever it's only in WebKit for now, so I don't I don't believe there is even a, a an official thing we can use. It's it's definitely going to be a browser extension, but it's kind of weird. It's not a browser extension attribute; it's a browser extension like value. So let's take a look at it. Um, it looks like this at its most basic level. We're using we're we're on the gradient grad box now dash webkit dash gradient and then you give it a bunch of values this is about as simple as it gets it's going to be a linear gradient starting at the left bottom ending at the left top so it's just a from left bottom to left top and then you give it this from and to and that's what takes the color values from so from the bottom it's going to start at 999 at the top it's going to end at e e e and it's going to fade between those two things so let's jump over to safari and look at what that looks like just as you might expect it, from a darker gray to a lighter gray at the top. That's as simple as it gets. That looks very nice, I think. Um, there's so much more you can do with this. You can give it color stops in between. So if you're familiar with, with uh, uh, dealing with gradients in something like Illustrator or Photoshop, where you can you know you have this gradient window open and you have these little sliders that you slide around and you can go ahead and throw another little color bucket in there and so it can fade from 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 you know red to a darker red to an orange to a yellow all in one gradient definition in something like photoshop or illustrator we can use the color stops are what those little kind of buckets in the middle are let's add a color stop it's just a, a, a <clears throat> extra optional parameter to pass this thing. I'm going to copy it after two comma space. <clears throat> Oops. Is 
let's, let's get a little funky. Some of these um, text editors aren't quite ready for for <laughs> these these new. Notice uh, the highlighting isn't proper on on border image, and the highlighting isn't possible is isn't correct on Mo Ma's border image. It doesn't know about these yet. You know, maybe it will in a in an update. This one's particularly funky though. It makes me worry that we did something wrong. The theory behind color stop though is at this point, at this percentage on our way from to, it's like 30% of the way up, bust out this color. Let's just see if it works. I have a feeling it's going to bork. Oh no, that worked. Um, it just isn't very different. Let's give it a more drastic color. 900, some crazy red. You see, it still goes from this dark gray to this lighter gray, but there's a color stop in the middle of crazy red. Now that looks completely awful, but you get the theory there, is, and, you, and you can keep you can keep adding these if you want to. We could have another color stop of something else uh, at you know 60% of the way up. It could be you know yellow. This is going to be even crazier awful. <clears throat> but there you go. That's how you can. Add, you know, that's, that's how you declare that kind of thing. This gets even more crazier and advanced than this. In that linear gradients aren't the only option here. Radial gradients are also possible. Basically, uh, uh, like globes of gradient. You know that that radial because they have a radius because they're circular. I just grabbed this code from uh, the CSS3 info site of mo giving it. Not only can you give it you know, multiple color stops on one gradient, you can give it multiple gradients, period. So check out this, like, monstrous bit of code here. I will paste it in because it would take me 20 minutes to write it all out, probably. I'm going to hit paste. <clears throat> multiple gradients. The radial gradients, which have different information that you pass it that has to do with its origin and how wide it gets, and, and, and but it still has the from and the to. Notice you can pass in hex codes, you can pass in RGB, you can pass in RGBA, pass in you know just color codes, you can use percentages. Where does it stop? It has color stops, just like that. Anyway, it's 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 this was meant to be in a little bit of a smaller space than what we're going to give it, but you'll get a good feel for it here when I reload. It's creating these crazy color globe gradient things. All, I mean, can you believe that's done without an image? I mean, really, it's going to open up a lot of p possibilities for some quick loading, but visually very crazy pages in the future. One more thing I want to touch on. That's probably maybe one of our longer things, but uh, 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 it's going to be cool. And there's some great examples for it. Is this is is CSS animations and transitions? Uh, they're a little bit different. We're going to be kind of focusing on, I believe. <clears throat> well, pretty much transitions. A, transi a, a transition is it's they're only supported in Safari or WebKit based browsers. Uh, uh, for the most part, and it, 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 it it's a bit like on CSS tricks. If you run down in the footer, and you roll over one of the links in the footer at this exact moment in time, they kind of shift over to the left. So if we were going to do that with 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 CSS transitions, we would say that uh, 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 we would say it has a WebKit transition of padding left. And then we would say in 0.5 seconds with the linear swing or whatever. Then when, 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 when that thing gets hovered over the event, we change the padding left. Oh, man, it's, 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 too, it's going to be too difficult to explain with words like that. Let's just jump into it. What we're going to do is make this red box here on the bottom fade it out with opacity. We're just going to use regular old opacity. So let's do that. Our goal is, though, when you hover over it to have it fade in. With no JavaScript, no jQuery magic, just pure CSS, right? Um, so we're going to start out by giving an opacity of 0 0.5. Save. Reload the page. You can see now it's faded out. 
when you hover back over. This is this is why it's this is one of the more brilliant little bits of CSS3 that's really going to work well with progressive enhancement. When you, when you hover <clears throat> over it, we're going to change the opacity back to 1.0. We'll reload the page, and now as you roll over it, it fades in, right? Classic, easy to do. We can use the CSS3 browser extension fanciness to transition between those two states in a very progressive enhancement way because in any browser that doesn't support it, it will support this still. So it'll just jump, but we're going to add in the, add in the, add in the fancy. It's going to, or we, we call them WebKit Transition. <clears throat> and it, first you tell it, what is, what are you watching for? It's opacity. That's the attribute that this transition is watching for. This is how long, half a second, could do one second, doesn't matter. And linear, and linear is like, uh, uh, if we were doing with this with jQuery, it's how it eases in and eases out. Like, this is going to be very linear. It's just going to, you know, it's just going to fade up at a very steady rate. There's different things that you can give this, like ease in, which will which will slowly start it and then go faster. Or or, or ease out, which will uh, <clears throat> start fast and then, and it's just, it's like if you can think of a, you know, a parabola or a sine wave or, you know, these different types of curves that you can apply to how fast and slow you want this to go. Linear is just straight line, just go from 0 to 10 and at a, at a very constant rate. Let's save and look at how this looks in Safari. See it slowly fade in, slowly fade out as we hover over it and over it. Very nice. That's why I had it at 0.5 seconds. I think that's probably a little slow. Let's make it even faster. 0 0.3 seconds. I'll reload. And then it'll come fade in and fade out very quickly as you roll over it. Pretty interesting stuff. There is so much you can do with WebKit transitions. It's not just opacity, of course. It's different padding values and sizes and, and flipping. That's why instead of, of me trying to demo these right at the end of this, we'll just look at some cool things that over our, on the Surf and Safari blog. This is way back from 2007. Safari was in the WebKit people were, were, were kicking with this. Uh, here's a, the, the fade in, fade out, pretty easy. Check out the spin. Do it. I have to reload. I think it only works the first time you click it. Crazy. Rotation works. This is applying a border back and forth. So CSS3, WebKit transitions, pretty cool stuff. Recently, though, in addition to transitions which are, I think are highly related to animations. And they posted on also on the Surf and Safari blog, webkit.org. There's this example of animations. Click to see the above animation in action. Check this out. Leaves falling down beautifully behind it. It's a little cheesy, but this is pure CSS. Pretty crazy. This is this is exploiting part of the the core animation that that you know Apple has installed when you have Safari installed. So even this even works on PC browsers. I'm pretty sure, but uh, uh, pretty powerful stuff. That's not that's not uh, those are just images. It's not uh, part of well, it's not a movie and it's not JavaScript kicking these objects around. It's just pure CSS. When Safari 4 came out and people downloaded it. Uh, there was a cool intro the very first time that you open up Safari. So let me let me open a new tab and say Safari. I'm just going to Google for Safari for intro, which will bring up the, the special page. Watch as I click this. It has this cool... It takes you to this page, which is live on the web. Oh, come on. Do your thing. Oh, what a tease. Where's the source? Do it. What a bummer. There's this whole thing that's supposed to launch and the name comes flying in and it fades out and there's music and it's all like, wow, clearly it's an image. And then it's supposed to be all amazing because... 
it's not a movie. Even the sound. Oh wow! Why why would this not work all of a sudden? This is on Apple's site. Maybe they. Maybe it's Apple's fault. Something happened today that ruined this page. Let's look at the source anyway, and you can imagine something awesome happening. Here's the source page of this site. This is bumming me out. There's this audio element into it that plays this cool, like, Apple drummy intro. And uh, there's a a video element. This is all HTML5 stuff. And then if if we look at the CSS that powers this page... There's all this WebKit transformations going on. So it's this thing that clearly just you just look at it and you're like, oh, it's a movie. And then to find out that it's pure, entirely CSS is amazing. Of course, it won't work at the end of my screencast when it was working five minutes before I prepared the screencast. Stupid Apple. Work. And it only works in Safari 4, you know, because it uses all this fancy stuff. If you go this in another browser, it totally won't work. Apparently, it doesn't work anymore. Boo. Anyway, that's a lot of stuff. That's all I wanted to cover today. All these CSS3 techniques, but just the ones that you can kind of start using today. That's the reason I had Firefox open here, is to reload the page and show you what the very current version of Firefox is supporting as far as CSS3. Notice the rounded corners. They're nicely working, but the at font face, not happening. Uh, the, 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 the shadow behind this thing, not happening. That's why I better not make it white text because that would have been a problem. Multiple backgrounds, not happening. Uh, uh, RGBA should be working. Maybe not, though. Let me do a force refresh. Yeah, RGBA works, but uh, this, the gradient didn't work. And then, But here, here's one of the nice ones. Remember, the, the transition isn't there, but it's still... The, the basics are there of the opacity changing. So, but this is this is Firefox 3.0.7, 3.1, which you know who knows when it actually get released. But it's getting pretty close at this point. That does have most of this stuff in it. So it won't be too long till really there's quite a good amount of browser share that's going to be supporting a lot of this cool stuff to use. So hopefully that was a good intro. Hopefully there's a few of you left still watching me ramble on here. Until next time, folks, we'll see you later. Bye.